Hey everybody, welcome to LA Times. Please take a second to subscribe, to hit the thumbs up and hit that bell, the notification bell. June 7, 2018, four years ago today, Pete Sano Ojeda died due to complications after shoulder surgery. This will be a small look back from my perspective on the life of Pete Ojeda and knowing the man. Before anyone says, why are you praising Pete? Or why are you lifting him up? I would like to say, hear me out. Don't be so quick to get on your high horse. First off, Pete has been some sort in my life since I was a teenager, a young hoodlum with my friends. He was always around in some form or fashion. Secondly, the video you are seeing right now was made by me for Pete's funeral. I was asked to do so by the family. I was also the guy given charge of finding the pallbearers for his funeral. In the final years of Pete's freedom, he had left Santana because it was pretty hot and moved over to the west side La Habra territory in La Habra, Orange County. At the time I was living there and I literally lived about four streets away from Pete. When he got his federal indictment, his wife had come looking for me to help testify for him as he had knew that my life had changed. That never happened though. So I hope you see I'm not just someone writing an editorial or just making a YouTube video out of the air, but this is someone I actually knew. Pete was born in 1943. He grew up in the Artesia area of Santana or Santa Ana, which is now mostly controlled by F Troop. Not a lot needs to be said about Ojeda's criminal history as it is pretty big. He never claimed to be an angel. He will always be remembered mostly as the key architect of the no drive-by edict meetings that took place in El Salvador Park and later spread through other cities in Orange County as well as eventually in LA and beyond. This is where the debate comes in guys. Before I say this, as I said before, there were times that I hated Pete. There were times that I loved Pete. There were times I was furious with him man and didn't agree with him. Pete was hated by most law enforcement as they saw the meetings as nothing more than a way to grow organized crime. So every time I do one of these profiles, I get the heat. You see, many in law enforcement believe that Pete was all purely wicked evil. That anything said nice of the guy shouldn't be said. So much respect to the law enforcement, man. Those guys out there keeping us safe. But let me tell you something, guys. This is the other side of the coin. And this is reality coming from someone who was there, someone who knew Pete, but also someone who was on the streets. What I'm about to say is almost taboo. Many, not all, but many of the moms who had kids and gangs running all over the streets, reckless, desmadre, who were running around doing drive-bys and gang violence, they took it as a breath of fresh air that the drive-bys had stopped. I mean, there was always those knuckleheads who would do a few, but for the most part, the drive-by stopped, the killing stopped. Undeniable. So unless you're coming from a purely law enforcement perspective, that's the only perspective that's wanted out there. But I'm telling you, from the mob's perspective, kids' lives were being saved. They didn't care who it was from, where the word come from. They just cared that they could sleep at nights knowing their kid was in the room that their house was not gonna be shot. So to say Pete didn't care nothing about young lives and it was purely to grow organized crime is completely not true. If you knew him, you would know. Now back to the other side of the coin though. Did organized crime grow? Oh yeah. Did prison violence grow? Oh yeah. So the fact that organized crime and prison crime did grow after these meetings or after these times, it's a fact. It's a history. I'm not revealing nothing. This is all in history or local newspapers. But the fact that the drive-by slowed down, that people really stopped dying, that drive-bys almost stopped is also a fact. So we can't have true history without saying the truth. The truth is the truth. I would say that both are true. That Pete committed a lot of bad crimes, man. He was a very bad man in a lot of ways. Definitely a criminal. Definitely, by his word, lives were saved. Regardless of what we want to say, regardless of how you feel about him, it's the truth. Of course, ideally, you would, you would rather that the peace came naturally. Nonetheless, it came, and the other side of the coin, it rose. So I just point this out that we could look at Pete's life and the history of what happened, that we could look at it and say, hey, this is true. Pete was a bad man. These things happened. But also, the drive-by stop. The killing stopped. Something changed almost overnight. It was incredible. Again, people don't want this said, and I'm not lifting up Pete. I'm not glorifying Pete. 
at all. His life is contrary or was contrary to what a normal citizen would do. But nonetheless, it is what it is. We can't go rewrite history. What happened in Santana, La Habra, Fullerton, went apart, everywhere else it happened. What I'll always bring up, as you guys know, I've been a born again Christian for quite a while now. And my goal was to try to reach Pete. I'll always talk when Pete comes up about his faith, his struggle inwardly wanting to lay down his life to the Lord, but seeming never really to do so that we know of. The battle raging inside was intense. In the coming weeks, I'll share a few stories that happened in regards to Pete, ones you probably never heard. Not mobster stories, but stories of interactions between Sana and Big D, Sana and Kilroy and others. Pete had a lot of people reaching out to him, man. I would always say to myself, man, if Pete would lay down his life for the Lord, what an example it could be to kids all over the place. That they don't have to live in this gang life. Let me tell you a quick story. And I should start by saying that Pete knew I became a Christian and he didn't trip. When I used to live in La Habra, one night my friend Ryan and I, Ryan's a friend from church, we parked in front of one of the houses that Pete frequently visited near a car wash. We stayed there about a half an hour, man, praying for him, specifically for his soul, for Pete surrounded himself with many Christians, man. It was a trip. It was almost like Saul when he would call David to come play for him and it would ease his soul, man. So I'm saying all this to say that you could see, even though there was times I hated the guy, I generally and genuinely cared for his eternal well-being and i care for yours listening too man and i prayed for him and we prayed for him and we prayed knowing that he wanted to lay it down knowing that he had conversations with people around me that he wanted to lay it down and give his life to the lord but always saying he couldn't he couldn't because everybody's counting on him so he cared a lot about what people thought about him but anyways nonetheless man we sat in front of his house praying right there in a little radio in la habra by the car wash man just praying for this guy what was interesting man is uh unfortunately the next day he would be arrested the federal indictment so as we were praying there was probably federal agents watching right there like what are these guys doing in the car and you know i don't know if they had listening devices but if so they just heard prayer man so we prayed for the guy and uh yeah man i had wrote him a few times in prison very interesting i have some stories like i said of big d of kilroy of uh jesse arredondo and others witnessing to him that I want to share. They're not mobster stories, they're faith stories. So hopefully they'll encourage you. So many times I've been asked, why did you help at the funeral, Paul? Why would you help with that mobster? They would call him a lowlife, thug, a gangster. Why would you even be there and get that on you? Knowing the FBI is going to be watching, knowing Santa Ana PD is going to be watching. Why would you do that, Paul? Now you see, man, I was there to serve his family and hopefully that they would see, man, that one day we're all going to have to answer to the Lord, serve them as they're hurting, losing a family member. You see, to Pete's family, he wasn't Mr. Mobster. Ah, oh, maybe there might be one or two that cared, but for the most part, he was just dad, uncle, brother, deal, uh, nephew. So he wasn't that, you guys. We got to remember, according to the Bible, he was made in the image of God, just like you and I. God made us and created us to worship him. These hands were made to worship him. So his memory is forever ingrained in California history. I know before he passed, he gave my friend permission, well, gave her permission to write a book on his life. Hopefully that's being done so you get another perspective. So today I hope you see that, uh, are you a good person? Do you have some shady or some secrets or something that, you know, you need to work on? You know, we all do, right? We all have things that we need to work on. We're not perfect and neither was Pete, man. Pete had rose in the organization to a very high level and he wasn't perfect, man. He wasn't a saint. He was a big time criminal, about as big as they get. So I'm not saying that he wasn't a bad guy, but I am saying today that hopefully today, we could realize that the next time we bring him up or or maybe you listening from law enforcement bring him up that we could say hey you know he was a human he had family members that he loved and yes did people get hurt on the other side through his life yes did all the organized crime grow yes did prison violence grow yes but also did street violence and drive-bys during that time stop for the most part yes did mothers stop going to funerals for the most part yes 
a lot of it stopped, man. A lot of it stopped. So I just bring it today for historical purposes that we get it accurate. Thank you for listening. And I want all you guys to know, if you're a gangbanger, it ain't the way. I think if Pete could say something now, he would say, get away, go to church and serve the Lord. I really do. I really do. And I'll be sharing stories about him and his faith. Did he ever make peace with God at the end? I don't know. That's between him and the Lord. But one day we will find out and it's not too late for you guys. So this is the LA Times and we are a channel that is unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So just know that we're never going to be ashamed to mention his name. And we're always going to seek the purpose of raising up his name and giving him worship, guys. So Pete Ojeda, four years ago, June 7, 2018, passed away. Much love, all. Hit, take a second to subscribe. Hit the thumbs up. I got more stories coming. This is just a general thing looking back at the life of Pete Ojeda. Man, whether you want to hate him, love him, or whatever, he was a man on this earth created in God's image. God created us all in his image and made to worship the Lord. Whether he did or whether we do, it's a free will. God will honor our choice in that last day. So anyways, guys, God bless you. Much love. This is LA Times signing out.